Bolliter and Ray Dental. I want to tell you guys, thank you for watching. Love y'all. Absolutely. So we got folks watching. They can even ask questions on there sometimes. They do that sometimes. I think they should. Yeah, they, it happens occasionally. Interactive. It is very interactive. Um, I never thought of it until it started happening. And I was like, oh, we, we have a question. They, uh, questions, let's, uh, yes. I'm like this. We have a question from the audience. <laughs> Anyways, sorry, I'm being a, a, a nerd right now. But I need to do more lives. That's what I need to do. I need to do live. It's a different vibe. It's a wow. different vibe. It really is. It's a good time. Um, and people like listening to lives because they know it's live. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They know it's real. It's if real you talk. screw up and you're really good at screwing up, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be epic. <laughs> Done. It's going to be epic. Um, all right, well, I'm here with Master Sergeant Nathan Coy, who runs the Incredible Wartime Leadership Podcast. Who did your cover art? Because you're killing it. Who, who made that? So I actually did my own cover art. Oh, my God. I do all my own on, uh, on Canva. I knew you were going to say that. It's, it's, it is amazing. It's so simple to use. You just start out with your design, and then you go. Uh, the original deal for the Wartime Leadership Podcast came from my company, Wartime Leadership, and I just added the words, the podcast wow and it might drop right absolutely but don't actually drop that I, no <laughs> i will cradle <laughs> cradle mike but no man um and then you know as someone who's been through it i know the challenges of setting it up i know how much time it takes i even know about the adversity because there is some you know there is some i'd say 99.99 percent want the positive message mm -hmm. and appreciate it there is a point one that's gonna hate on it so I know all about it. I know the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so when you started, and really if anyone starts in our community, I'm going to try to do anything I can to be a resource to, to help get them off the ground, to help get them exposure. Because I love it. I love that you guys, I love that we exist and mm -hmm. we're making this community. Oh, and community is the word. Community is the word. So when I started out, like people like Trip Bodenheimer, yes, you know, with the shadows, he just walked by, by the way. Oh, hello, Trip. Yeah, and you, both of you, like you were the first one to actually reach out outside of the people I knew, ah. and kind of grabbed onto me and said, "Hey, let me help. Yeah, let me show you what this looks like." Because wow, yeah, you're, you're right. There is adversity in there. There are people that are just going to be there to suck the life out of what you're trying to do mm -hmm. and it's just it's saying no just doing the heisman keeping them at arm's length just no you're not going to get in the way of this right especially when you know everybody wants it to happen and is enjoying it and getting you know actually learning about each other and bringing us together mm -hmm. you know i would ask those people why are you really opposed to it you know what i mean like is what? it because you didn't do it yourself <laughs> yeah like what's Nothing negative is coming out of here. So what? what is, it, it, it just sounds like a personal problem. Mm -hmm. You know and, what I mean? It is. It's somebody that has, okay, you've got issues and you just want something in your life that yeah. is, is able to egg on and go. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I know about that side too. And so I, uh, I admire anyone who, who does what we're doing, which is having a tough conversation, you know, being vulnerable. Like no one's forcing us to do this. Mm -hmm. We do it because we care, right? Oh, absolutely. And then Todd Simmons, courageous leadership. You have to be courageous to lead. We could take the easy route. We could just do the, the status quo and go home. Mm -hmm. But when you put yourself out there to make everything better, that does take courage. This is time away from my family, right? Right. This is time away from my wife. I have dedicated certain amounts of time to doing podcasts. Yes, I, absolutely. I try to record two a week. If, if I'm able to, just so I'm ahead of the game yes. when it comes down. It's a, it's a constant struggle. Yes. And I do it after hours. Me too. Or during lunch. Or, or during lunch. You I like, do mine like, like You understood nine. when I said, hey, we need, to, we need to do it during lunch. You understood that because you're thinking the same way I'm yep. thinking. How can I squeeze this in to not interfere with like the stuff that I love, the people that I love? Mm -hmm. And it, that's, that has been, especially at first, it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. At first, you, they are going to you know you're taking away from my time 100 percent. there's no way around it because the learning curve is outrageous at first oh yeah you know what i mean once you start to get in the flow then you can find you know clever ways to make it work for everyone but it's that community 
it's exactly what you said. It's the community that comes around and says, listen, I've been there. I've done that. I've experienced. Let me help you. Here, here's anchor.fm. Here, here's this. Hey, yes. here's a great microphone to use. To come around and be able to do that took away a lot of that to yes. where I didn't necessarily have to worry about it because now I've got somebody who's alongside me saying, been there, done that, learned from my lessons, and I'm vulnerable enough to say, <laughs> I, I got no clue. Right. <laughs> Which, by the way, I have become so much better at like hooking things up and electronics and just and photos and videos and editing and lighting. Like my skill set from this experience has grown astronomically. Hey, listen, folks out there in, in Instagram land, in live land, let me tell you something. When I walked up and Josh was over here, I mean, just he came from lunch and immediately he's just messing around like had everything ready to go and then i was like hey you think everyone and he's like no i'm gonna move this boom he's already over here doing it it's like it's instantaneous i don't know don't know how we just got to get after it mm -hmm. you know what i mean i've lived my life way too long with self-doubt with fear paralyzed by it i didn't actually start living my life until i'd already been in the air force like 11 10 11 years yeah it was like that that, that's a whole episode in itself. Mm -hmm. Oh, we will talk about that. Oh, hell yeah. I'll come on and talk about that. You're darn skippy. Yeah, I'll, I'll share that whole story with you, my man. I almost died. You're going to want to hear this story. Yeah, yeah. It, well, I know just a smidge of the story, and it is absolutely amazing to hear what you've been through and where you are. Two completely separate and different things. Yes, yes, absolutely. I agree. Thank you for that. And uh, But this isn't about me today. It's about you. <sighs> How you like that? The tables have turned. Oh, no. The tables have like turned. It. I don't like it. I've taken over Wartime Leadership Podcast. <laughs> Hero Front Takeover. <laughs> this is mine now, but, but I am sharing this episode with you because this is a cool experience. Oh, yeah. We're both talking. The light just died. Don't worry about it. it is what it is. It is what it is. <laughs> it, don't, it don't last that long. <laughs> and you know what? I usually only use it for one guest, not six in a day. Yeah. Oh, yes. No. So it, it did hang in there as long as it could. But my point is, I will share this with you. You will put it on your podcast mm -hmm. because your listeners, they need to learn about you too, man. They need to learn about your views too. Yeah. And it's hard, you know, because I want, I'm about other people's stories. Yeah, that's true. Except for today. Okay. Yeah. No. Right. Nice try. Yeah. Um, but we're going to start with the hero's gauntlet. And I think I stole this from trip. I'm pretty sure I did. Uh, and I'm okay with that, but. <laughs> He would, so the Llama Lounge would ask questions at the end. Trip took that and put it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think the beginning is better, personally. Softballs. Yeah. So I started doing that, and it actually has led to some pretty funny stuff occasionally. Well, let's do it. Let's um, do it. Or serious stuff. It could be anything. So, but we're, because we're live and we're both here, I'll let you ask me after I ask you, okay? We'll take turns. So, yes. my first Heroes Gauntlet question to you is. What was your proudest Air Force moment? Mm, wow. Ooh. There's been a lot of special moments. A lot of special moments lived out. There's been some really terrible moments as well, to be honest. Yeah. Um, my proudest moment would have to be in the Air Force the day I got my M MTI campaign hat. Whoa. That was the proudest. That was that moment where I had proven everyone wrong, right? Wow. When you say proven them wrong, are they the types that say, "Hey, man, uh, I know you got goals, but this ain't for you, bro." Dude, prior to coming to be an MTI, and this was back in 2014, I was very laissez-faire. I'm just, I'm just kind of hanging out. You know, if you need something cool, you know, you got it. Hey, you know, whatever, go try it. You know, Absolutely. Uh, I, I wasn't very serious in the way that I approached a lot of things. Now, 2014, I head down to Lackland to go through this journey. And everybody that I talked to prior to that was like, yeah, no, you're, you're not that type of person. Even me, I was self-doubting on this. Absolutely. You are not that type of person. I wasn't. Like, if you have self-doubt and then your peers or leaders, you know, confirm that self-doubt. Mm -hmm. That's hard to that's hard to bounce back from. It's mm -hmm. it's hard to take that that step or that chance on yourself when you're telling yourself negative self talk. They don't believe in you either. How the hell did you find the courage to actually sign up when everything was telling you not to? So I was the second variation of DSD. 
Uh, so Ooh. went through that deal of yeah. you're going to go. It like, wasn't it wasn't a choice. I got an email, Josh. It was it was April first. I remember. I was like, this is the greatest April Fool's joke I have ever. It was had on in April my life. Fool's Day. It was great. I went up to my chief and I was like, look at this. Look at this. I got a letter and it looked so official. And he's like, oh, yeah, no, that's true. He's like, they don't, they don't joke. Yeah, no, that is, that is not a joke. <laughs> and, and I was like, are you, are you serious? I called my wife and I said, Hey babe, you remember that job? I said, I never wanted. Oh my God. And she was like, mm hmm. And I was like, yeah, we're, we're moving to Lackland. Oh, where were you at that time? Uh, we were at Andrews. That's where and I, I was. Up. I was loving life. Yeah, I grew up in Waldorf as a. My dad was stationed at Andrews. Dude, yeah. blue crabs, man. Hell yeah! I am a huge blue crabs fan. We lived in the neighborhood that actually was around that baseball stadium. Wow. I, we were living the great life. We were doing everything. Yeah. But got that email. Called my wife. She's my biggest supporter. She yeah. is the biggest supporter of my life. Yeah. Um, and and everything was great. Like moved down to to San Antonio, did the job, and I and I. That day I got my campaign hat was the best day of my career, and it was also one of the worst days of my career. How the hell is that? So it was best because I proved everybody wrong. Yes. It was the worst because a guy that I had known for years at Lackland had committed suicide the night prior. You're kidding me. And here's the thing. He was supposed to be there. He had flown in from Turkey to spend uh, time with his parents, with his dad oh up God. in just outside of Boston. Yeah. And he was, he, I had called him at the beginning portion of the week, said, bro, I just saw on Facebook, you're, you're home. I want you to come. You know, he's like, oh, I've got my, uh, my, my one uniform. And I said, no, it's fine. That, that's perfectly good. You'll be in the front row with my family. He was like, he was excited. He was happy. Guy comes and, and time passes. He's not sitting in the audience. I never call him back, right? You just assume, oh, he must not have made it. Just just assumed, okay, hey, stuff came yeah. up, he's home. I don't want to take away from that time. Dean, uh, Dean Warren, one of the guys that we, we mutually knew, came to me and said, hey, man, did you hear about Santa? And I was like, what are you talking about? He was like, Santa uh, committed suicide last night. Oh, my God. Had no clue. Had no clue. That's heartbreaking. And, and in my head, I'm going, man, if I had only reached out, if I would only said something, if I would only been like, hey, bro, I'm just making sure... But the mentality of the people at home was still the same mentality. We had changed in how we handle things. The minute that you step into the Air Force, the minute that you find that family outside of the family, right. you start to change and you handle things differently. And he was, but a lot of his past got caught up with him in that right. moment. Yeah. And he made that, that worst, the worst decision an individual can make. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry about that, man. Best and worst. Best and worst. Wow. So like you proved everyone wrong. You're riding on this high and then you get some of the worst news you've ever heard mm -hmm. to someone you just spoke to. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's like, wow. And then you start thinking like, what could I have said? Should I have said something else? And then you think, well, no, he seemed excited about mm -hmm. it. And then you're like, well, was that an act? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Was and, that? And I know it wasn't because I know he was genuine. I know he was a genuine yeah. individual. He was the Robin Williams of the group, man. Like he made everybody laugh. He made everybody cry. It was, it was amazing. He was a great guy for that. Yeah. But he had a lot of stuff going on that he didn't allow a lot of people into. Wow. And I think that's where the difference was. But best and then worst, the first thing I had to do while wearing my campaign hat was actually work his funeral. Wow. So that's powerful, man. I'm so sorry you lost your friend that way. That's that is deep. Uh, and I'm proud of you too, just for you know, finding the words to share his story still, you know, because there's a lot of people that need to hear about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and especially the suicide survivors, the people that are left uh, in the aftermath, right? Mm -hmm. That don't often get talked about. So I think it's beautiful that you, you know, you, you've you remembered your friend uh, and you still try to include him even, you know, when he was in his darkest times. Mm -hmm. Still try to include him in your life. All right, well, that was my question to you. And now you got to ask one to me. See, and it's so weird because the, the questions that I ask are, are literally like this. And you did just do that. And I just completely went that direction with it. Yeah, so, you could have said I helped a lady across the street in, in, in blues. She was amazing. And I'm wearing my hat. And yeah. she said, thank you for your service. And I said, you're welcome. Right. Okay. No. You, you could have said that, but you didn't. You no. chose to tell something else. Let's get real. Yeah. Hey, so how about this, Josh? Give us a moment. Okay. A moment in your life where you had to lean on spiritual resiliency. Oh, I see what you did there. Uh, okay. Okay. 
I can tell you the most spiritual moment of my life, which is when I needed to lean on it. There you go. So, um, I came from a religious family, Joshua David White. So, <laughs> oh yeah, it's there. It's literally in my name. Um, and I always loved Bible history, the, like the children's Bible. I love Samson. I love David and Goliath. I loved all those stories. Uh, the Joshua and going around the wall, so they came tumbling down, and all those stories. Mm -hmm. I love them. Uh, so I've always had uh, the spiritual part of me internally, um, but I kind of lost that at some point, or just didn't acknowledge it anymore. Mm -hmm. My family went through all sorts of divorce and and struggles, and you know, financially we were okay, but emotionally. You know, we were taking some major hits uh, at a certain point in time. And after I graduated high school, I just wasn't in a good headspace. Like, just from everything that happened, and my dad was a, a commander in the Air Force. He obviously wants me to join the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And so did I. You know, I really didn't have anything else going on, and I always kind of assumed I would join the Air Force. You know what I mean? I just kind of knew. Uh, and so, he was worried. He, he was really worried about you know, where my head was at and, and the, the type of crowd that I was hanging out with wasn't the, the greatest. Mm -hmm. And so he sent me to live with my mom who was in Virginia with my stepdad. And I just really started like doubting myself, like joining, you know, I thought like, well, I have to live with my mom before I go. Like, is there something wrong with me? Hmm. You know? And I just, I started kind of feeling depressed and I wasn't sure if I could actually leave everything behind. So that's a huge step to leave your whole life behind, you mm -hmm. know? It's kind of hard for us to remember because it's been so long. But if, if you could go back, that, should, mm -hmm. that was scary. That was a scary moment, whether you knew it or not, that it was going to get real. You know, once you realize, like, home ain't your home anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I ended up finding, uh, I ended up going to church with my, my mom and my stepdad. I was on the delayed entry program at this time. I met this guy named Chris Rodenheiser uh, out of a church in Virginia. I'm pretty sure he's still there. He was like the pastor's son hmm. who did the youth uh, stuff, but so much time has passed. He's probably now like the main pastor, I would assume, because it's been like, you ought to reach out and look. I, I'm friends with him on Facebook, so I, I need to hit him up, but his name's Chris Rodenheiser. Amazing guy. Uh, and he really connected with me. Him and another guy named Wig, who was like really hip. But like, they were just so welcoming and just so kind. And they really helped quiet those fears and anxiety that I had. They really, really, truly helped me through it. Uh, and I ended up getting baptized at that point. I read The Purpose Driven Life. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't know then that I know now is that purpose is everything to me. If I don't have, I, I was missing it for many years and that was my darkest time of my life. Purpose is everything. Everything. It's why we joined. Mm -hmm. When you lose e the purpose. E even if we didn't know that's the reason. Even if you didn't know it. Yes. Uh, and so I read The Purpose Driven Life, which was uh, written by Rick Warren. And that, that blew my mind. I started seeing signs and like, you know, like almost like a, like a navigation through life. Things were popping up kind of mm -hmm. pointing me in the right direction. And that still happens to me to this day, only during certain times. It's not a constant thing, but it does occasionally pop up. Uh, and that, that could be like the Holy Spirit just trying to like give mm -hmm. you that hint. You know what I'm saying? That little nudge yeah. that we all need sometimes. And yeah. that's exactly why, and I know you're going to jump into the next question with, with why what? we did the podcast. Yes. <laughs> this is... The I'm first sorry. topic. I'm reading it. I'm reading right You're not now, supposed to I read it. I'm sorry for jumping ahead. You're reading my notes. Okay, but no, my uh, but to answer your question, just to close that out, before I joined, and all that spiritual resiliency that I built mm -hmm. that I never had, the community, my perspective, purpose, all that, I was healthy enough to join. And then mm. I did. And I never looked back. Oh, that's awesome. So yeah, that's the answer to your question. See, I took your, your easy one. And I made it into a home run. What is this, like a tennis match here? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, there it is, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so our first topic, and this is about you, my man. This is about you, the freaking Wartime Leadership Podcast. Could you get a more hardcore name? That sounds, that sounds just hardcore, well, man. You think about it. 
think about what we're doing with it, right? That's what I want to hear. Wartime leadership. Wartime leadership podcast. Wartime leadership. It, it, so the, the idea came from the company that I started, Wartime Leadership. Uh, really kind of helping churches identify leaders from within and, and really putting together systems, coming out of the logistics career field uh, in the Air Force to being able to help individuals identify what that looks like in their organizations. And I've been doing it for free for a few years, just kind of helping to build the brand, build up the idea. And I was sitting at EPMEIC, Enlisted Professional Military Education Instructor Course. That's wow. That's a lot. Um, Dang, it's like a Dr. Seuss book. It really is. Uh, green eggs in ham. Uh, so, <laughs> I, so I'm sitting there talking to Trip Bodenheimer, yeah. and he's talking about his podcast, and we're kind of going back and forth. And it was just like, it just like hit me. I was like, you know, what is the one thing that we say people need to have but don't talk a whole lot about? Okay. Resiliency in the spiritual sense. Something that I connect to. Like that people I can, don't talk about to the point where if, if people start rattling off the pillars, they'll forget like spiritual, mm -hmm. like social, physical, mental. Uh, you know, yeah, they, they but, even forget to say it. With, with physical, we tell people go out for a run. Yeah. Hey, you need to go out for a run. You need to be active. For social, you need to hang out with people. You need to, to at least invest in somebody like that. Uh, for the mental side, you know, here's what we have all the answers filled out there. But when it gets to the spiritual, we go, you need to be spiritually resilient. They say mindfulness. Yes. Or something. Yeah. It, Meditate. Which I get because those are aspects of it, but they don't try to get into it. And, and I was like, why are we not having the conversation? Why are we not talking about what it is to me? Because each individual's experience mm -hmm. is their own experience. It's what they're going through. And some people literally don't know how to do that, how to live that out in their life. Right. Because they, they, because we don't talk about it. Because we immediately equate it to a religion. We immediately equate it to a god. We immediately relig you know, relate it to this. There's different aspects of it, and we don't have that conversation. So I found... You know, even though I come from everything from a Christian point of view, mm -hmm. when I'm talking to a guest, it's, I'll give you an example, episode five, Jeff Johnston. This guy is agnostic, completely agnostic. One of the greatest conversations I have ever had. Really? Was me just asking why. So he lost his son to drug overdose. He lost his wife about two years later to, uh, to self, to, to mm -hmm. mental health as he says. Mm -hmm. And he was like, how am I not being bitter through all of this about who, who took my wife, who took my son from me? Mm -hmm. And he's looking at it from an agnostic perspective. And it was, it was great. It was a great conversation because he told me what he did to get through it. And here's the awesome thing. Okay. They overlapped. Did they? So he would go for a run. Yeah. To clear his mind. Mindfulness. He right. would go to the gym to, to lift weights. That's a physical thing. But for him, it was it, expulging. He was getting rid of getting rid of all these thoughts from his head because now he's concentrated on the weight. Right. He was going fishing with his son. He was going to play golf over. All these things were overlapping. We realized that those pillars are not one in the same. It, you, My man, I have said pipe. that so many times to people that you can stack the pillars. That's what mm -hmm. I call it. Ooh, so I like, like that. Yeah, I was thinking about stolen. Stack the pillars, man. So, like, why is CrossFit so popular when it first hit? It's because it stacked the pillars. Mm -hmm. That's why. Because it's physical mm -hmm. and it's social. You're making friends. It's a network. So, yes. like, that, that's when I first started noticing that concept. And, and it's, it's amazing because we didn't look at it from that perspective ever. Perspective is everything. I say that all the time. Perspective is everything. It has opened up so many good conversations for people. Uh, Nina, she goes for a run across the mountains. She thinks about her stepson who, who passed away, you know, uh, trip he he does it in the form of movies you know different ways of how they become spiritually resilient it doesn't rely on one answer is god one of those answers absolutely is he not one of those answers absolutely but it's opening up that conversation to people right. and not being shut down of my way is the way here's how you're going to be spiritually resilient and that's how the podcast came was just a simple conversation and here we are uh, episode 25 releases tomorrow. Wow. Uh, we've got, we're averaging around 2,500 downloads an episode. That's amazing. Which is, which is great. It's a good, great support system that, that has come from that. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I had I recently had my dad on. I saw that. Which he's a Vietnam vet. Yes. Didn't get thanked when he came back. He talks about how he dealt with the ideas of coming back from war and not being, you know, blessed and, and having people thank him. But now my his 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 grandson, my my son, he sees a Vietnam cap, he knows exactly what it looks like, and he goes up and he says, Welcome home. No. And so that's impact, right? He says that? Yeah. That's so that's wow, that's heartwarming, man. I had my dad was my first episode. Mm. So like when I saw you do that, I was like, bro, we have a lot in common. Like, you know, just us talking, we had a lot in common. But yeah, I also had my dad on with his Air Force experience. He was a senior master sergeant, became an officer, retired as a major, and at one point was a commander. Wow. So like, and then he did 10 years on Andrews as a civilian. So like, <laughs> you're talking like 30 years. So, of course, I try to, you know, he's my best friend, my biggest mentor, because, yeah, like, he's always been there, the one constant that I've had. Mm -hmm. uh, and then both my grandparents, both on each side, were in the Air Force as well. So, wow. I love the legacy part. And so, when, like, you taught your son to recognize that hat and have him give that message, mm -hmm. like, that probably means the world, you know, to those vets. All they want is your time. You know, like, they want your time. They want to be seen they mm -hmm. want to they want someone to talk to them to point the hat out that's why they're wearing it and my dad now follows that up by helping out with the va in helping veterans write claims because wow. he knew the struggles he went through and all of the people he had been with went through yeah to get up to that point absolutely and so it's even better josh when you're sitting there on top of the uss whatever you know eisenhower and my son sees the cap and yeah. grandpa's there and grandpa starts walking towards the guy to tell him welcome home and instead the grandson is running i love that shakes the guy's hand and then here comes grandpa with the same hat on hey brother welcome home i love that impact it legacy is connection mm -hmm. yes gratitude mm. right oh you're, you're preaching to the choir at this point josh <laughs> yeah like i didn't know what gratitude was I, I talked about this earlier today i didn't know what gratitude was until I had a special duty, until I did honor guard. And that, that's when I started really understanding what gratitude was to me. But dang, it took a while to really understand it for me. Uh, and so for you to be teaching your son principles of gratitude that young, I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. That's really incredible. Well, and his story is one that will, when he is old enough to tell it, yeah, his story is one of resiliency and, and the need to be grateful for what is out there and we'll talk about that here in a little bit he's he's my hero so he's your hero wow, yeah, that's beautiful he is. i love that man so any more on your podcast or do you want to hit als no i think i, hit it all I do have a podcast. question for okay. you okay uh -huh. i do let's, let's just do one more question you told me about the one episode that really stood out to you with the uh, agnostic mm-hmm what other episode aside from that one was the most memorable and was it and what was the reason that made it so memorable you know i just want to give you a moment to talk about like one of your guests that we can look up and we can the anyone watching can go look this episode up and literally hear it i will tell you it, the answer is my dad's episode but that's for a very specific reason of well he's my dad and it's my father's day episode but if it's somebody outside of that it would be a uh, general gronsky general gronsky yes let I, me tell I, you you told me about that when it happened i'm pretty sure mm -hmm. you, you said hey like you got to check this episode out like this is like look who i talked to like this is amazing so why don't you tell us a little bit about him and what y'all talked about you, you know it wasn't that aspect of look who i talked to it was the aspect of look who talked to me like this is awesome that he invested time into me he took an hour out of his day he's sitting at his big old desk he's got the the computer on he's got the camera pointed at him and like i start talking a little bit about his book he kind of pulls away from it you can just see the humbleness of who this person is yeah and that he would at the time it was like it was 10 episodes in or something like that it was i was actually at episode six and he was going to be episode 10 like it was itty bitty it was maybe like two people my mom and dad listening to the podcast that's what and, i always and, tell people yeah. i'm always like hey family hi mom hi dad you're in my number one and number twos i love and you. my sisters yeah and, and we, i mean we weren't at very much and right. he took the time to invest in me wow and 
and just his leadership perspective. Yeah. I love his book. His book is absolutely awesome. That's awesome. Uh, it breaks down at the back of it. It actually has like little like action steps that you take. And wow. they're like legitimate action steps to these leadership pills. But I mean, this guy is, is in a, in theaters of war. He's leading men and women, uh, cross, you know, multiple branches. Yeah. He's a general. He's one of, he's one in a million. I mean, the but, things that he's accomplished, his outlook on life, the way he mm -hmm. thinks is so, is probably so unique that to get that insight mm -hmm. is invaluable. And then for him to spend time with you where there's really no gain for him because mm -mm. you're brand new. He's all about just helping you. Mm -hmm. And from someone in that position, I'd say he's pretty humble to so, do something like when that. When you say leader, when yeah. you say the word leader, like his image pops up in my head. Oh, wow. Just looking at the things that he's done, where yeah. he has placed himself, what he's now doing in corporate America. Mm -hmm. it, it just, it humbled me to think that he humbled himself to come down to my level. It almost feels like he came down to my level, but he would say it differently. He would say, oh no, I'm having to step up to talk to you. Right. Which is cool. Yeah, it's cool that he sees it that way. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I could kind of say the same as far as like someone who helped me out when I was a little bit newer was Sam Eckholm, who basically ran social media for the Air Force and has like this insane following. He had no gain whatsoever to talk to me zero mm -hmm. zero gain compared to what he'd already built and he came on and then yeah he he put me on the next level out of the kindness of his heart so like when stuff like that happens podcasting does open special doors like that mm -hmm. where you are able to spend time with someone uh because you know they do like to share some certain stories about themselves even even if even if no one's ever heard uh, that particular story, you know, you could be surprised with some of the stuff that they bring up. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Love the podcast, though. Uh, Nate, you keep kicking ass with that, man. You keep I'm serious. You, don't stop. We need more podcasters. We need more leaders like you leading from the front, having those conversations. I've wanted to multiple times. Quit. Yeah. And you're a very unique guy, like in a great way. And I, and I, you, ju you definitely stand out. I usually say weird, but you know, unique is fine. I'll take that. <laughs> I'll take unique over weird. I said it in a great way. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> but I like weird. I'm weird. I am a weird individual, and it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it makes everything better. It really does. It does. It makes I need to get better. one of those. Yes, Jeff. You I know you're going to be listening to this. I need one of these. My producer's Jeff. Jeff. Yeah, he, if he's not watching live, he can do the watch back. Oh, he will. And Jeff, uh, yeah, if you are watching this, this is a, a Zoom box, no relation to the Zoom streaming service. Not at all. Who do we got on here? Jay Harris. I, and Jay Harris is here. I've seen him walking around. He's got a great smile. Uh, let's see. David Sever. Wow, we got, we got a lot of folks watching right now. Ryan mm -hmm. Cruz, my public health homie. Fred Allen, Deploy, public health. What's up? Kimberly Tucker. Dang. There are no questions, though. No There's no qu hey, if you guys have questions, please let us know. Maybe I can't. Yeah, I think you'd be right there. Hmm. If you have any questions that you can type, let us know. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, I want to talk to you about one of the special duties are always fun to talk about because oh, they're yes. one of the, they really are a special duty. Mm -hmm. You don't realize how special they are until you get there. It huh. seems super daunting um, to do them. It's a lot of responsibility. There's a lot of freedom of movement with special duties. And one thing they all have in common, there's one of you and a whole lot of airmen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what they oh, all yeah. have in common. And I don't know if anyone's ever said that, but it's something I noticed. I never thought about it. I right. never thought about it. You actually just made the light go off on top of my head. Just, Heck wow. yeah. You hear that? <laughs> um, so ALS. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me you got to do be a TI and do ALS? Yes. And bro, how MTI set me up for the for the commandant position? So I'm actually the commandant at Joint Base Charleston. You know I love you. Uh, so opportunity knocked, and the opportunity came up. I I had switched back to my career field. I was doing good things in my career field. Two T two Port Dog. I loved 
loved that. But there was just something inside of me that I needed to continue with the instructor side, with the, with the legacy side, right? If I'm going to get out at 20 or 21 or 22 years, what am I doing to fulfill that legacy? What am I doing to continue to fill and backfill the airmen that are coming up? I came from the generation, you come from the generation where it's beat down, beat down, beat down, stop asking why, just do the job, get it done. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't like that approach. They, this generation is not asking why questions of, explain to me why I have to do this. They're saying, why are we doing this? They want to know deeper meaning. They have deeper thoughts about it. They're not questioning you and I as to why they're doing it. And so by going back, uh, I was able to, the, the Commandant listing came out and, and I said, yes, I'm, I'm going to put in a package. I did an interview, did all, did all of that. Super nervous with the interview. I know I screwed up like three or four things, but here was the difference. I was very humble about, it's actually really weird to say humbly that I was humble. Like about bragging being about humbly. being humble. Yeah, it's just, it's weird, right? Like <laughs> I was very humble. You see it in me. I was the, the best humble person. <laughs> number one humble. Number one humble person. Humblestly humble. <laughs> uh, but I, I mean, but I, I was like, hey, listen, I know I didn't give you the answers that you, you want to hear, but they're probably the ones that you need to hear. Yeah. And I was very open about that. They had one of the instructors, Jennifer Section, was in the, the meeting and, and I guess they saw something in me that, that I was able to bring to that team. And I thought right. it was very important that they had somebody there from the team to hear yeah. what I had to say because they needed to know that I had the best interest in them. And so I put in that package, got selected, moved over. There was, there was some scuff coming from the career field because I did another special duty. They're like, that's not fair. Well, <laughs> but, yeah. bro, but bro, you're, you're a special duty guy. Oh, I, I love it. Yeah, it's, like this is mm. this is your thing, man. This it's, is your it's thing. called passion. When you find your passion, yes. it becomes a purpose. I would much rather have you doing multiple special duties than someone who's not really into it or doing it for the wrong reason. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you're the man for the job, straight up. And stepping into that, it was really neat because I still have to this date former trainees who were my trainees and had, you know, knife hand Nathan in their face <laughs> who come through and so, then they see this side of it and they're like, oh my gosh. I, I feel like you'd be a terrifying TI. I just feel like you would be because because I'll smile. I'll do the smile thing and then I'll be like, oh, oh, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, it, it added a whole nother... And I'll tell you why I know you'd be scary. Because you're passionate. Mm. That's what it is. You're passionate. You're fired up. And I know you leveraged that oh, to, yeah. be, to, to crank up that intensity. Because even if I was having a bad day, I walked in there listening to rock music like I am. This is going to be the worst day of your, uh, best day of your life. You know, it was just, <laughs> it was going to be one of those moments. But it was also the aspect of this. Every single day as an MTI, I would crack a joke really i would crack a joke you know is that okay like is that is that there's by the playbook there, no this, this is your, really outside this of is it. your twist on it right here's why i did it okay is that if i crack a joke in what might be considered to some people the worst day of their life and they crack a smile yeah i know you're still there i know you are still there so right. I'm not going to break you. I'm going to take you to the point of broken, but I won't break you. I'm still going to crack wow. a joke. I still want to know that they're human. Yeah. And I transcend that into that ALS environment. Yeah. Now they get to see me for yeah. me being that person. The aspect of care. I tell them in the most important part of ALS, we don't teach them anything. Wait, what? We do not teach them anything. They I, come I didn't to there. expect you to say that. They come knowing what leadership looks like. They come knowing how to be a leader in their section. Oh, what wow. they don't come to us knowing is how to connect it to the person next to them who is maybe their flight line and I'm support. Maybe yeah. their personnel and I'm medical. They, yeah. they, we do in that aspect, teach them how to connect and utilize their resources. Josh, you're an amazing speaker. You are an absolutely amazing, impeccable speaker. I'm going to come to you because I have to give a speech and I'm not good at it. Mm. I'm going to utilize your skills. It's teaching them in that aspect of actually teaching them how to utilize their sources. I'm not going to teach you how to be you and be the leader that you already know you to be. 
Right. I'm going to teach you to learn different ways of how to go about doing it. That's beautiful, man. I love your philosophy. And I want to throw a curveball at you right quick. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of baseball references today. Let's get a round of applause, y'all. You, you hear that crowd? You feel that? Mm, I'm getting pumped up. Yes. I'm actually doing the queen wave right now, which is really weird. But mm, whatever. <laughs> so my question to you, man, is you've clearly been challenged and you've clearly hit the mark on these special duties. That's no easy task. I've done a special duty. It is daunting. Mm -hmm. It is draining at times. Right? It's never ending. There's, I call it never a dull moment. If you're doing a special duty, 100%, you will never have a dull moment. Every day will be exciting. I could promise you. Oh, yes. Right? Just, just because there's so many people, something's bound to come up. Right? Every flight, every class is going to have 39, 62 different personalities. Yes. Mm -hmm. Was there a time where you weren't so awesome, where you were beating yourself up, where you were you know, trying to figure out who Nathan Coy really is. Still to this day. Because I see the finished product, or near finished, where you're just this incredible guy doing this podcast, Commandant of ALS, prior TI. All I see is the good stuff. I know you had to work your tail off to get to that point. So I'm just curious what struggles you faced to get to that point. Every day. Every, Every day. day. Every day is a struggle every day wow and because i look at it this way josh i am my own worst enemy i am my own worst critic mm. i critique myself day in and day out and i and i will be like oh you're such an idiot why did you do that oh. <sighs> even in my marriage even in my marriage i was like oh you're an idiot why did you open up your mouth and say that she's the most loving individual in the entire world and you just said x y and z every day but that's also how you get better as long as you turn it around and if you don't waddle in the sorrow if you don't waddle in the, the mistake and you learn from it my leadership perspective is this imagine you're on a road you're you're on a trail and you're running yeah i i know that after coming out of being an mti i was very much the pusher i am going to push you to get better to get faster yeah. but i also know that in that moment i'm going to push so hard that you're going to probably fall on your face and bust it on the flip side, I can also run way ahead and say, come follow me. And I am just booking it with the rabbits yeah. flying past everybody. And I lose them. I lose the people all the way back in the back. Yeah. So I have pulled myself out to the side. Oh. I pull myself to the side. Okay. So this way, I pull myself far enough away from the situation that I can see all the way in the front. Yeah. And I can see the rabbits. Yes. I can see the people to the rear and see where they need to catch up, where they need to get better, where they need to get faster. But an organization is only as good as the middle of the pack. Individuals that have the potential to continue forward and to yeah. be better or to fall further back behind they have that that they're at that pivot point when they can do that so i choose to hover in the middle i'm going to push when i need to push but if i push too hard and they start to fall forward i'm still close enough where i can catch them oh i want them to skin their knees josh what I, did you think of this? i want them to hit i was actually out on a run <laughs> go figure i you was just on painted a run. this whole picture in my mind i was picturing a circular track mm-hmm and then you're kind of in the middle and you can see everything around you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like as you were saying, and I was pick that's what I was picturing. Hmm. If you skin your knees, you're learning. You're learning. Yeah. If you bust your face, that's organizational failure. Yeah. I don't want organizational failure. I'm yeah. not going to push you that hard anymore that that happens. But skinning your knees is perfectly okay because that means that you have learned a lesson. We all have learned a lesson now of where that point is. Get back up, brush yourself off, and go. Definitely. So that's why I say I'm my own worst critic. I don't do that for myself. But I surround myself with people that do. That's my beautiful. wife. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer Sexton, uh, Cortland Theobald, Christian Wages, all of these individuals that I have in my life that, that tell me those moments. Absolutely. That's beautiful, man. I love the way you think. I love the way you painted that picture for me. Well, thank you. I appreciate I, I that. I can see it in my mind. That's amazing, man. And so speaking of more on ALS, we talked about caring and the importance of caring. I want to tell you real quick my philosophy on mm -hmm. it. 
when I made when I became a senior NCO and I was trying to figure out what that meant, I felt this enormous amount of pressure to like know the most and be the best. I did. Mm -hmm. And when I didn't know something, I was humiliated. I was like, oh, excellence in all that we do. But here's the thing. At some point, I started using the people around me mm -hmm. and really leveraging their talent and really caring about them. And that's when it clicked. I'm, I'm the senior NCO, so I care the most. Not because I'm the best mm -hmm. or do the most. It's because I, I just need to care the most. If I can care the most mm -hmm. and it's sincere and it's genuine, then all that other stuff will come together. Absolutely. That's how I see it. So I just want to tell you my philosophy. It's just been on my mind all week. Well, it's a good one to live by. You're utilizing the team. You yourself know that your strength is in rounding up the talent that's around you and yeah. using it yes. while growing their weaknesses. Yes. That's important. The, the act of caring. Day two and day two on through ALS, I have a running theme that you will constantly hear. Okay. I cannot tell you how to care. I can't tell you how to care, but I can show you in everything that the staff does, you will see care. At the end of the day, or at the end of the telephone call, even if it's on the weekend when my staff calls me with whatever kind of update that they need to provide me with so I'm aware of it, mm -hmm. we at the end of every single call, at the end of the day, we say a simple phrase, love you, mean it. So one person will say, love you, the other person will say, mean it. Wow. It's not an act that we do. It's it's we do it whether the students are in front of us or it's just one of us leaving at the end of the day to another instructor. Right. Love you mean it. Yeah. There's so much in that. I can't tell you how to care, but I will show you. You need to care enough to tell somebody that you don't care. <laughs> I, sometimes when you show them though, you show them that love. It, sometimes that light bulb will go off. Mm -hmm. It will. You know when you for instance, I worked with a guy who was my polar opposite, and he's my best friend. His name's Jeremy Rutherford. Uh, he's stationed at Whiteman. He's a reservist. He's insanely analytical. Mm. He's a coder. He's a software guy. Uh, in honor guard, he's standards. He, he had the whole manual memorized. Literally, he rewrote it because he is a freak of nature. <laughs> now, me, I'm on the other side. I'm like, what's the AFI? <laughs> you know, I'm I'm a people focused. He's results focused. We're polar opposites, but we became best friends mm -hmm. uh, because we. Oh, low battery. All right, good thing you caught that because I think it blacks the screen out. So hopefully they hop back on here. Um, but yeah, my point is we. We filled in each other's weak spots. We got better by spending time with each other. And we were complete polar opposites, but we found that common ground on, on, on how, to, how to each learn from each other's strengths mm -hmm. and weaknesses. And like one of the great, I always try to get his respect. Like even though I outranked him and I was his boss, I still wanted his respect because he's, he's, he doesn't just give it to anyone. Mm -hmm. I, it doesn't matter what rank you are. He won't respect you unless you earn it. He's that kind of person. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I got to get this dude's respect. Um, I got to earn it. Right. But one of the, the best things he said to me was that like, he saw, he was not a believer in people focused mm -hmm. type of activities until me. And that was the best compliment I ever had. One of the best, because he said that I made him a believer and that I actually had an impact on his approach now because he saw it firsthand. Mm -hmm. And I'm even more proud of him because he, he lost his brother to suicide, which is something that was like his best friend. It mm -hmm. wasn't just his brother. It was also his best friend. And it, it haunts him to this day. It's why he does military funeral honors. Um, and so when I first met him, he couldn't even mention it. And by the time I left, he would share it with the class, why he's his why. Mm -hmm. And it was really beautiful to see him have that trust in us to tell us that and to see him grow in that side that was never really fostered mm -hmm. you know so and it's it's like a, a really good marriage yeah y you complement those weaknesses where where i'm weak my wife is super strong right Absolutely. and in, in, the, in that flip where i am super strong she is usually tends to be weaker and so we just play off of that and that's why we make such an amazing team with one another yes is because we uplift each other in that way 
that transcends into the workplace because the Air Force, the military in general, is completely different than any other organization that you will ever be a part of in that way. We right. care more about the personal than like if you're working at McDonald's. They're not going to necessarily get personal on all levels right. to that degree. Unless they're super bored. Well, there's that. <laughs> there, we need to... Oh. There it is. Okay, good. There it is. Sorry, was I allowed to do that? I don't. I didn't know. Don't I'm you touch? Yeah, you can do that. I'm. I'm just impressed you knew which button it was. You're paying attention, my man. Hey, you're focused. It's those eyes. You're. You're focused, brother. Um. So, have you always cared about people, or did someone have to show you, or is that just you? I saw my parents doing it. Say what? I saw my parents caring about really? people. Uh, so they were. And I'm so happy you, you got to see that because I, oh. I love my parents, but yeah, <laughs> they showed me what not to do in a marriage. I'm just gonna leave it at that. Well, and <laughs> but here's the deal: you learn from it, and now you're you're not recreating that will. Right? Trying not to. There is trauma. Uh, well, there is generational trauma. You I'm bring not, that into it. Yeah, but, but, but it's I'm still aware growth. of it. Yeah, I'm aware of it, and I am actively trying to not become that. Yes. Absolutely. But I'm not going to lie and say it's not a struggle. It is a struggle. Well, see, I watched my parents go to prison ministry to go do prison ministry together. So they're in jail. They're talking to people. They're, they're, they're holding services. They're doing stuff like that with people that have been sidearmed, that have yeah. been, you know, by society, like, okay, you, you are Which, a bad person. I mean, I felt one one hundredth of that and it drove me nuts. I can't imagine I cannot imagine how that feels, you mm -hmm. know, being in that spot and, and just being shunned on that level. So for your parents to do that, that's like, man, that's incredible. Oh, it was awesome to watch. Yeah. And, and they, they did that in such a way that it showed me what I needed to be when I was a dad, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's something that is transient. Now that didn't happen until just recently to become a dad, but I'm learning a lot of those aspects. I'm enacting a lot of what I already witnessed. Yes. But also every person that we meet or every with the parents, there are still aspects that we don't like or that we, we wished had been different that we wished had. And it's, it's learning from those mistakes that we saw that we experienced that we don't do it to our children. Right. And guess yeah. what, Josh, you're not a perfect dad. That's correct. I'm not a perfect dad either. Yeah, definitely I do not. stuff that screws up all the time and I make sure that I follow up with my son and go, listen, buddy, their dad had a bad day. Dad had a bad moment with you. Yes. Yes. Let him know that. Let him learn from my mistakes. So when he becomes a father, oh my gosh, I just said that. When he becomes a father, yes, you did just say he that. doesn't do the same thing that I did yeah. and screw up. But when he does, he brings it to the table and says, I did. I think it's important to, to re I think that's super important that you're telling him that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, imagine if you didn't. You know, he, that could turn into shame. That could turn, who knows what that would do. They're so like impressionable. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so my anger's horrible. Like I still have those MTI days when I'm like, oh, you go the hand into, of God like, is coming down. You can go into TI mode? Oh, yeah. Easy. Small things will make me pop. So it's almost like you're hardwired that way now. Yes. That's and, interesting. And I have to backtrack a lot. Yeah. Especially with him because of the household that he came out of. I really have to back backtrack you need that. grace and patience oh yeah can we talk about him because our last topic's adoption i knew it was i was helping with the transition brought I it in who for I was the talking to a professional brought it in for the win <laughs> oh my goodness yes okay so adoption and mm -hmm. by the way i i am also uh a fan of adoption i haven't adopted myself but we did find out my wife found out when she was after we were married that she in fact was adopted wow yeah she found out as an adult yeah um mm. and that was emotional for us you know that that was emotional it was emotional for me to to see it i oh, mean honestly and you had to be that pillar yeah i was like mind blown um and i'm very proud of her for the woman that she is today i really am um because she's handled it much better than i would have if i'm being honest uh, and but I'm a fan of it because I wouldn't have my wife or kids if it wasn't for adoption. Really, mm -hmm. that's why it to me an adoption is is a miracle mm -hmm. because the chances of it actually happening and working are so slim. Right, it's mm -hmm. such a hard process to go through. You you think it'd be a little easier? It's not. It's a hard process to go through, 
And so like, think about my wife, she's born in the Philippines, right? She gets adopted and like all the, the whole universe, mm. like made all these moves that are one in almost infinity chances of happening. Oh yeah. So like our, my kids, my wife, the whole dynamic is an absolute miracle that it actually happened when you think of the, all the moving pieces. Mm -hmm. So to me, adoption is, is miracles happening, in my opinion. Well, I'll tell you about ours. Uh, how much time do we got? Brother, this is yours. This is your... <laughs> Wrong move on that one. Okay, hey, 30 so minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife and I, we, we were told that we were unable to have children. This is just a, a little deal that God hadn't blessed us with children up to that point. Yeah. Uh, and... and we get it. We, 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 we had always talked about, even on our first date, we had talked about adoption as being an option. We, we just both felt really, really pulled to that. Uh, when we were finally able to start the process was in Texas, and we started it there, but an MTI schedule is not exactly the easiest one to work with. You're working six days a week, one day off, at least back then, that's what we were doing, 10 to 12 hours a day-ish, either at home learning how to teach the material or actually engaged with a flight for that 10 hours. Uh, so it wasn't a, a, a conducive environment to that. Yeah. So once we got to South Carolina, we immediately started the process. So we started going to the classes. We started doing all this. Uh, we got the approval in 2019, December 17th of 2019, wow. to, to, to start the process. Bullet, like to say, okay, here's a child that we love. And it feels so weird. You're like window shopping for a child. It is so weird because you're looking through websites and you're like scanning pictures like left, left, left. Oh, that's a possibility. Right. It, it felt weird because you don't know what this personality of this child is. You don't know if you're going to get along. You don't want to go through the prompt. Weird stuff. I'm saving yeah, photos heavy, up man. till that day. Yeah. I'm saving photos, like, you know, screenshotting photos. And on December 17th, because my wife and I told each other, we're not going to show us, show the other person a child that we want potentially to adopt if we're not approved yet. So she, December 17th, we get the approval to start the adoption process. She shows me a picture at night. We're laying in bed one evening. She shows me this picture. And I go, why are you looking at my phone? Like, that's, that's not fair. You, you're looking at children on my phone. And she said, no, this is my phone. And I was like, that's, that's Stanley. She says, yeah, this is a boy that I'm really interested in. That I'd like to see. And I'm like, so I rub out my eyes and I go over and I get my, get my phone and I show her the exact same photo. Oh my goodness. Mine is in color. Hers is in black and white. Two separate websites, no. same picture, same child. Unbelievable. We're reading the story. It impacts us. He talks about how he loves to go to church. He talks about how he loves to volunteer at church. And we're like, okay, well, we're church people. And, you know, in this case, and just reading a little bit about him. And then we had already set up that we were going to adopt, like, up till the age of eight. Okay. Stanley was 11. He was, he was older than you even planned. For. Older than that. But here's the thing, Josh. You look at a child and you know. Wow. It's like looking at your, your child that's freshly birthed. Like, you know, that's my child. And there's this love that you automatically have. So you started falling in love with this child as a parent right away. Mm -hmm. And when you saw that you both pulled up this same child, that was like a spiritual thing. I have this statement and it's on the back of one of my t-shirts that I sell. It says, comma, but God. And that was that moment for Lena and I. We were both without child. We were both alone. We were both dot, dot, dot. Comma was that decision point we're going to adopt. But God stepped in. Yeah. It's huge for us. I mean, that's a sign like no other. Mm -hmm. Like, there, there's no more obvious sign than that. Like, there's some subtle ones here and there, but mm -hmm. that is pretty apparent it's right there yeah it's right uh, there apparent i like how you did that josh uh oh I, I just did that on accident you didn't just even know dad Hold jokes <laughs> there it is dad jokes just falling through me naturally Eight, 18 december i pushed the button to say we would like more information on this child and and in the state of south carolina it goes through this process where you you they say okay so here's this child that is that someone is wanting to adopt we want to make sure it's the right person so they pulled together at least five families to put into the kitty and say, okay, here, county, county member, you need to look and choose which family, you know, adopts this child. It was around the holiday season, obviously. So we 
it's supposed to be 30 days by state law, but because of the time period, they, they extended it. So we're waiting for like 45 days. Like, when, must have been when are we going to get this? When are we going to get the, When are they going to? And then it became eventually, when are they going to call us and tell us we didn't meet the criteria? Like you started losing hope. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But God, we continued to pray. We continued to reach out. We continued to, to lean on one another in such a way. And it... it then we found out in January, they were like, okay, we've selected you to come up here. Mm. And I'm not going to say the city because it's a known deal. We, to come up here so that we can run you through the background. Well, Lena and I had already gone through this listing of, okay, these are things we just don't think we can handle. And, right. and we get into the meeting, they, they pull up Stanley's story, yeah. and they start reading. And what's the first thing out of their mouth? Stanley has experienced, boom. And we look at our list and we're like, oh my gosh, that's like the number one thing we don't think we can handle. Oh my gosh. But it was almost as if God was saying, hey, I'm getting the worst out of the way. Now let's look at the rest. And, yes. it, and it was amazing. So they want you to take 24 hours to listen, to, to, to think about, to talk about it, to come back with an answer. And I said, listen, I, we can drive home. We can tell you 24 hours from now, we can tell you 72 hours from now, or you can take our word right here in this moment. I'm looking at my wife right in the eyes as I'm telling this third party person over here, I'm talking here and I go, I can tell you then, I can tell you in 24 hours from now, but right now I can tell you that that's our son. Oh my God, that's they, powerful. They've never allowed it. We signed that day saying we want to know more. The next week we went up and we met Stanley for the first time. And the picture that I have on my phone is actually that first meeting that we no. had. That's no. That's the first time that we met him was on that day. And he was the most respectful child. He's 11 years old. He was super short. You know, when we went hilt to kilt, hilt to kilt from the beginning of saying we want to meet him to, uh, to when we finalized the adoption was eight months now what happened in 2020 COVID-19 COVID on public health COVID happened they got Can I show the is that yeah you can go I just thought it'd be cool to show yeah. so here's the picture we're looking at there he is this cute adorable little boy and this is the first time y'all met yep wow and 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 they went through Hilt to Kilt was eight months they had gotten a two-year background because of COVID but mm. somehow, comma, but God yeah. pushed us to the top of the list and we got seen, had everything done. We actually, he was on a certain medication that really zombies somebody out. Mm. And he was coming down for his first meeting with us, which was supposed to be three days. It, yeah. Because of COVID starting and them not allowing me to take him more than 100 miles, we had him for 10 days, Josh. Seven days without this medication. So because of like, oh my God. So you're, so you're telling me because of like, isolation and quarantine guidelines mm -hmm. some sort of exposure occurred making him have to stay with you mm -hmm. without his medication and we got to see him without it and i'm telling you right now josh i i am a big proponent against this medication because i saw this child for who he really was i feel like i know what you're talking about we don't have to say nope. it on here one um, day of pure hell led to six days of oh my gosh i love this child this this is amazing so that's almost like in the plan for you mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what i'm saying like mm -hmm. like what are the chances of that happening it, it very rare <laughs> i mean think about it COVID. everyone's like oh my goodness i don't know what to do so like you got to see the child unmedicated mm -hmm. no zombie status by the way, I've been on prescriptions that cause zombie status, and I have to say there's no worse crippling feeling. It's like you're mm -hmm. a prisoner in your own mind. It's horrible. And being able to see who he was yeah. in reality yes. was amazing. Well, you would, I, I would hope you would see that well, yeah, I mean, before, he's, he's before adopting us, a child, but oh, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, oh, no. That's kind of like, I never even thought of that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, You have like a personality altering medication you would need to know mm -hmm. both sides of that coin you know what i mean you couldn't just do one so, so I'm, I'm very thankful that you got to see the real him uh i'm sure he started opening up mm -hmm. the zombie status went away maybe he started uh communicating a bit more absolutely Why and don't you run me through that there was a lot more to it he 
so the the 10 days kind of passed we we finally got to see who he was we sent the dss figured it out took him back to where he was from with his foster mom we we didn't get to see him again for like another month and a half like we're doing telephone calls we're zooming we're like hey buddy hey how you doing you know it's it just we're trying to continue to make it real in his head that he's he's going to come home so he did two more visits and then eventually they're like just take him and so we had him in our house for like a month and a half uh within a week of the court date they came and said here's your court date let's see this and then he was with us forever at that point eight months hilt to kit push the button see the see the judge once we get him back we again work him off of this medication doing it slower this time instead of a, a sudden whoop, flip. yeah that's never good and he started to share so much more and and with he's a lot more open about it with my wife than he is with me due to the trauma that he has experienced he's he's a lot more open with her uh it's his story to tell i'm not going to tell it i'm not going to tell it to you today i'm actually recording a very special podcast episode where each i'm asking him a series of questions wow. as he grows up and then on his 18th birthday, I'll release that episode. Oh my goodness. So man. that it can be a continuation of who he is wow. in that journey. Even if I don't have the other podcast any, anymore, I'm going to release that episode on his 18th birthday. Yeah, that's beautiful. And just seeing who he is. Yeah. And now we're, we're settled in. Here we are two years into it. He's amazing. He's, he's finally grown this personality. Uh, he's not hurt as much. Uh, he's, yeah. he's allowed a lot of that pain to go away. We've worked really, really, really hard to get that done. My wife is absolutely amazing working with him. Mm -hmm. And you, he now has a story that he's feeling more comfortable to tell to, to people like you, to other people. You know, he's, he's open about it a lot more uh, because it's who he is. Yeah. And I get to be dad, man. You get to be dad and you get to help him. Like, if you're ever hiding, find yourself hiding something, mm -hmm. that, that turns into like a shame. That turns into isolation, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's so beautiful that you found this, this way to have him express himself, to build the trust with you. You know, he probably hasn't had a lot of trustful people in his life, right? Now mm -hmm. he has that and, and you're showing him that trust. You're giving, restoring that faith, giving this child a life. I mean, that's beautiful, man. Bandaging up some of the worst pains you'll ever imagine oh done to somebody. Yeah. And that's that's a joy for us to do that, though, because we've gone through very little. And, and I say this on the podcast all the time. Listen, just because your level of pain is not the same as somebody else's doesn't make their story any better than or worse than yours. It's your story. It's their story. Live it. Yeah. Just live it. And we get to be a chapter of, well, hopefully more than just a chapter of his book of right. life yeah and i love that man i love that for you man for real i'm very proud of you and your wife mm -hmm. for i mean you wow it, it's just a lot to wrap my head around <laughs> but like even the things that you agreed you you went around that like the age thing the trauma thing certain things that you weren't sure you could deal with even with all those barriers you still found the love in your heart to take this child in, to put in the work, and and like your your mom and dad now, mm -hmm. and I'm so proud of y'all, man. If you limit yourself, you limit possibility. Don't do that. Do you think you guys were limiting yourself? We were very much. We were limiting because we zeroed in on here's what we are going to handle, and whenever we released that, yeah. The possibility, we, if we didn't do that, we wouldn't have this child with us today. And I can't think, <laughs> I'm getting emotional thinking about it. I cannot imagine not being Stanley's dad. Yeah. I can't. And I don't ever want to think that. Yeah. And I don't want him to ever think that we were limiting him. Right. Uh, you didn't. You no. never did. You never did. You were faced with it and you never limited. I mean, he, he's going to know that his whole life that you guys never limited or held back your love. Not once ever. Damn it, Josh, you got me crying. I did get you crying. <laughs> yes, we got you crying. That's a, a podcaster win is when the guest sheds a few <laughs> tears uh, and we and we have that connection. But no, I, I think it's just a testament to, to you, your loving heart, your faith, your character. You're an incredible person, man. I appreciate that. I'm so glad and blessed that 
I met you, that I had a, a, a small part in helping, mm -hmm. and that I'm still here to help, and that I'm your friend for life. I'm your brother for life. Absolutely. I'm so honored to say that about you, man, for real. And I'm proud of your wife, too. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I, I know how much the spouses do and how much they, they kick butt and get our backs. Like, I, I, I totally understand that. And what they go through to take care of us. Yeah. We're a freaking mess, man. Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> Dear Lord. I, I told my wife all the time I would not be here without her. Period. Dot. She saved my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and my kids continue to save my life. So, shout out to your wife as well. What's her name? Lena. Lena. So, Lena... I don't know if you're gonna watch this. Maybe you can skip to this part at the oh, end. Yeah. But Lena, if you're watching, thank you for being such an awesome mom and taking care of this guy. Appreciate you. World's hardest job. World's hardest job. There mm -hmm. you go. All right, Nate. We talked about wartime leadership. We talked about ALS. We talked about caring. Mm -hmm. We talked about the incredible story of you adopting your son and all the magical signs that pointed you in that direction. And look at you now. <laughs> You're a dad. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And you did it with love. You did it with love from your heart. And you, once you release those barriers, man, I, I'm going to take that philosophy, bro. <laughs> I'm going to take that philosophy. But I want to just leave it open to you, man, if there's any last thing you want to say to anyone who watches the live stream or who listens to this whenever you know i'm able to release it which is probably december at this point <laughs> <laughs> is there is there any parting words you have for the team hero front family listen hero front it is it is a blessing to have each of you listening to these podcasts and supporting in the ways that you do because it's the continued support that you bring to people like josh that you bring to me uh, that we're able to continue to build each other up because it's about building each other up it's not about tearing down any walls it's not about trying to be better we all have podcasts if you look over there in the corner you'll see all the podcasts all the influencers over there we all have them and while they seem similar there are stories and they're your ability to tie into them tie into somebody else you're not any better than anyone else no one's story is better than yours nobody's story is bigger or less than yours it's your story live it out be blessed i love that y'all nate you killed it man you killed it i'm clearly talking to a a, a podcaster <laughs> you just have a very magical way of expressing yourself that was very touching so i just wanted to thank you too man Thank you so much. I'm going to give you a hug after this. No, absolutely. But I just want to tell you, thank you for just being you, for being transparent, for showing us how it's done, showing us that it's okay to, as a man, to get emotional about the things you mm -hmm. love. <laughs> that's, that's very powerful. And I just want to thank you for that, man. I'm your brother for life. Anything you need, you let me know. Absolutely. All right, y'all. This was...